My name is Jeannie Forrester. I'm the senator for District 2 here in New Hampshire. You know, New Hampshire tops many of the lists. We are one of the safest, healthiest, and most livable states in the country. But we also have some of the highest rates of youth abuse in alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs. Drug and alcohol abuse weakens our communities. It harms our economy, and it costs taxpayers millions each year as a result of increased criminal justice, health care, and other costs. As a member of the Senate Finance Committee, I was pleased to have led the legislature's efforts in increased funding for the state's drug and alcohol fund. These dollars will finance important prevention and treatment programs and allow us to redouble our efforts to address our state's substance abuse challenges. But in a small state like New Hampshire, it is imperative that legislative efforts are reinforced by strong community partners, partners like the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, in order to ensure that we are reaching all of our citizens in need and producing the results that we are looking for. The foundation's significant monetary investment is critical to advancing the kind of evidence-based practices that are driving initiatives like the recently announced Youth Prevention Campaign. And the organization's outstanding staff, led by my friend Tim Rourke, in his role as the chair of the Governor's Commission on Substance Use, provides the invaluable resources for policymakers as we consider policy solutions to address the difficult questions raised by substance abuse and misuse and work to ensure that public resources are invested wisely. Now, a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit one of my communities up in Plymouth, um, one of the organization's communities for alcohol and drug-free um, youth. It was their 14th annual prevention summit, and it was a room filled with 200 people all there to learn and to support uh, youth in the communities, in the surrounding communities. And it was at that summit that I first saw um, the video that you're about to see that um, Tim is going to introduce to you. And I was so impressed. Very, very impactful. I think you'll find that uh, when you see the video tonight. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with you to watch that video again. And I want to thank all of you in the room tonight for your investment in our youth. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tim Rourke. I'm the Director of Substance Use Disorders, Grant Making, and Strategic Initiatives at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. I'm so honored to be here and to Dr. McAfee's opening comment. Um, I'm a child of prevention. I've been involved in the prevention field since I was 15, doing youth leadership work with a program here in the state of New Hampshire where they made the bold decision to share with me the message that my voice mattered. It's amazing what happens when you give that message to a young person. So I'm honored to be here tonight and talk about our work on behalf of kids. Our work in substance use is furthered by our partnership with leaders in the public sector. I want to thank my good colleague and friend, Senator Forrester, for sharing the stage and sharing the work with me, as well as other policy and public leaders, Governor Hass and members of the general court that are here this evening, community partners and grantees. New Hampshire is blessed to have significant philanthropic capital due to the generosity of several foundation donors who understand the challenge we face with substance use disorders. Thanks to donors like Oliver Hubbard, Armand Auger, and others, we distribute more than $2.5 million a year in grants. And new donors continue to seek ways to invest with us in solutions to what is widely seen as the state's number one public health threat. While the foundation continues to work with partners around expanding access to treatment and recovery supports, we recognize that substance use is a chronic, relapsing condition that is, in most cases, entirely preventable. 
That's why in 2012, the foundation made a commitment to invest $12 million over the next decade in evidence-based strategies to prevent substance misuse among youth. As part of this investment, the foundation is supporting a statewide awareness campaign launched this past March by the Partnership for Drug-Free New Hampshire. At the reception this evening, if you go out into the lobby, you will see samples of that campaign here tonight. The campaign targets parents of young people between the age of nine and 17, encouraging parents to recognize the significant rates of youth substance use in the state of New Hampshire. Although the state is often known as the healthiest state in the nation, one of the best states in the nation to raise children, <clears throat> parents are often surprised to know that we lead the country in rates of use among many of our young people. But behind that data, there are also stories. Lived experience of those who have struggled with addiction and found recovery. In raising their voices, they are working to raise awareness and prevent more youth from being lost to the disease that in our state plagues way too many. The video you're about to see introduces you to one of those voices. I am a recovering addict. Um, my use started when I was 13 years old. I was you know, in Cub Scouts, I was involved in sports, and you know, I was in a really nice, I had a really nice family. And like, there was no problems that I had. And you know, life was really good. And I got to middle school and that's kind of where my life started changing. I was hanging out with my friends up the street and I got involved in marijuana. Like one of my friends was just like, oh, do you want to try this? And I was like, sure. And, and then from there, I just started smoking pot like every month or so, just once or twice a month. And slowly over time, I became heavily involved in drugs. And in the last stint of my use, I was shooting up heroin pretty much every day. Whatever I could do to get uh, messed up, I would do it whether it's pot, drinking, or you know some prescription painkillers just made me feel invincible and I was like on top of the world. Little did I know that this pill was gonna destroy my life. You know, I didn't think I had a problem. I was like, you know, it's just, I'm just having a good time just being a teenager. I'm just, you know, doing what normal teenagers do. I was stealing from my family. I was stealing from my friends. I was taking whatever I could that wasn't bolted down and selling it. It was just, it was like a snowball. Like once I started it, I couldn't stop it. It was just rolling down this hill and I could do nothing to stop it. And I still didn't think I had a problem. I was like, oh, I can just try this drug and it'll be fine. I don't have to do it for the rest of my life. I won't get addicted to it. That doesn't happen. I'm not that kind of person. One of my friends told me he stole his stepdad's iPad and traded it for heroin. and. I was mad at him, so I took that text message he sent me, sent it to his mom, his mom showed the police, the police came to my school, and then I admitted to my parents that I was shooting up dope. They had no idea, they were completely caught off guard. I put on a charade that I was okay, that I was getting better, I didn't need any rehab. The last day I used, I was sitting in my room, and I just, I don't know, something came over me. And I was just like, I don't want to live like this anymore. Like, I've destroyed my relationship with my family. I've lost countless friends. I'm, I'm a nobody. There's nothing good going in my life. And I'm going to die if I continue this. So I told my sister and my brother I relapsed and gave my dad my paraphernalia six days later. On my 18th birthday, I was admitted to my first rehab. It changed my life because it showed me that you can be happy without the use of drugs. Due to the st skilled clinicians at the Phoenix House, a foundation grantee during our adolescent treatment initiative 
Alex is very close to celebrating six months of recovery, which means he has not had to have a drink or a drug since January. Because of recovery, Alex's mom and dad have their son back. Alex's brothers and sister have their brother back. His aunts and uncles have their nephew. His grandparents have their grandson. His school has their student. And in about an hour, that school is going to join Alex across the street at the Verizon Center and hand him his high school diploma with plans for him to attend college in the fall. <clears throat> and because of recovery, Alex and his family decided to share their struggle publicly, knowing that their voice and story has the potential to serve as a powerful message for prevention. Their commitment is so deep that they took time before that ceremony to come here tonight. And I would love the foundation community to congratulate Alex and thank them for their courage. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Berry.